Even though the counter stands outdoors, it's not rotten or dirty, and you guess that like the other furniture, it's brought inside every night. Eric's approaches you with a smile and leans on its surface with his fists. He's portly and even taller than his neighbors. He's got freckles, short gray hair, and an elegant beard. His long woolen orange tunic has a decorative cut right underneath the neck and loose braids at the edges. How can I help you, traveler? His accent is heavy, nothing like his wife's. He stomps with heavy, a heavy boot and looks around, as if he's just waiting to get back to his other tasks. His fingers are still dirty from weeding the garden. I'm trying to remember. I'm gonna have to talk to old Foggy again sometime. Uh, any rumors to share? Rumors? Not really. I have my own things to worry about. Neighbors keep their own company. Better for everyone to seek help from a wife or the forest speakers than a mug of ale. What time is it? It's getting late, but I can probably get a room here anyway. So no rumors, but maybe you've heard about someone who may need my help? You say this if I expect travelers to get here any day now, I'll ask around come tomorrow. Any interesting guests recently? I don't know. He scratches his beard. There was one vagabond, but he was not here long. It did not do much. Timid fellow, talks loudly, but is afraid of everything, especially the guards. His face is touched by flames, has a big ballista. He says this word in a strange accent, smirking, and a large bird as his beast of burden. He didn't know what to say. He shrugs. He went south and is most likely gone. Any food rations I could buy? I keep them in the hall, smoked mutton, a sack of dried fruits, nuts, biscuits. We eat fresh here and pay with work. Coins are not worth much. When he thinks, his lips move as well. Let's say one ring for enough food to fill you for two days. And Havlavan, that kind of price would buy you three, even four times as much food. If you're in the mood for spending, I also have something special. Just give me a minute. He goes upstairs and returns with a small wooden box and a hand-long leather sheath. Uh, tis a teeth set. You're afraid of what he's going to show you, but then when he opens the box, you realize he meant teeth cleaning. See? He points at three different compartments. Salt, cloves, and mint. You mix whatever you want here. The fourth holds only a small pestle made of polished stone, and here are the twigs you need to last for months. Seeing you're not convinced, he takes a deep breath. Well, we do not let outsiders bathe in our creek. But give me two dragons, and I'll ask my kids to get you in shape. We've got a hot tub with soap and rose oil, and they'll wash your clothes in water. I'll cook you something nice, as much as you can eat. That would be nice, at least for the cleaning, because I'm filthy. Show me the rations first. I assume this is something that I could use at cleaning spots to increase the amount of cleanliness. <clears throat> Two meals for one. I've got seven. Get as much food as you can eat in a proper bath with laundry. I don't need food, but... Three, four, five, six. I'll do... This, this, ah, uh, someone dreams of a healthier smile. He rubs his hands, but before you take it, he puts the box in front of you. I've got the hazelnut twigs in the sheath, but can replace them in no time. What taste are you looking for? Gosh, is this gonna matter for something? Walnut, apple. Oak, willow, hazelnut.
I have no idea. Puello? He disappears for a few minutes and returns a couple of twigs and puts it puts into the sheath. What else do you need? For now, uh, I don't need food, but is it worth doing the cleaning or do I just stay filthy and I can clean myself for free? It just takes time. Um, leave the square, go to buy on the tailor. You follow the guard's directions and reach the whitewashed building on the western bank. Next to a small garden of flowers and herbs, it's well kept and clean with a plain beaten front yard and parts covered with sand. Through the open windows, you catch a glance of the furniture made of smooth, almost shiny wood and hints of dark cherry-like red decorated with carvings of plants. A woman in her 40s is sitting on a wooden bench. The table is covered with fabrics, threads, and needles made of bone and iron. She's sewing a long sleeve to, what, to what's going to become a blue tunic. Her movements are quick and confident. Her brown, wavy, shoulder-length hair is tied into a wreath-like braid. But other than that, her clothes are simple and inconspicuous. She doesn't have a left leg, but you don't notice any cane. You observe her for a few moments until, without sparing you so much as a glance, she encourages you to speak with a grunt. I'm looking for a tailor. You found one. Her voice is low, but she doesn't stop her work. Her name's Bayan. Any idea who would have left this rawhide behind? I found it at the northern road. Bring it close, but keep it away from my fabrics. After a minute of examination, she tells you to take it away. Very sloppy. Those from Creeks didn't know what they're doing. We wouldn't buy it, no doubt. Creeks. I'm um, interested in a new set of clothes? Question mark? She stops her work and looks at you briefly. I, I can tell. You don't hear even the hint of mockery, but that's a lot of work. And I don't do not take work lightly. If I were to give you anything, people would see it. And I'll not let you show them some rags. And by that, you mean your prices are high. You reach for a pouch and she answers with a nod. It'll take a day or so to finish and fine fabric. Your city clothes are... She frowns. Just fine for the wilderness, I guess. But what I'll give you is for the time give you is for the time with lamb meat and mead and a pathfinding the longer the outfit you want the higher the price so i'll consider the things people say about you as well fine let's discuss it 27 33 38 wow fitting for a rich city official make you look like a merchant good for a socialite or a diplomat wow I cannot afford that. Gamison needs work. You take it off and point at its tears. The woman follows your finger patiently. Here's my price. For two dragon rings, I'll patch it up in half an hour. If it was in worse shape, I'd ask for more time and more rings. To get it truly strong for longer, it needs to be made of better, better materials like spider silk. I actually have some spider silk with me. Would you buy it? Now let me ask about the spider silk. It is silk made by spiders. I meet her eyes. She's the first one to break the silence. The large ones. They use it to spin webs. It's stronger than thread. But my neighbors do not walk the woods no more. It is getting harder and harder to get any silk. I actually have spiders that go with me. Was you like to buy it? You show her the wrapped stick, and without asking, she takes one of the shorter threads and starts to stretch it. She nods. I do. What do you want? The dragon rings or a better jacket? You ask for the details and she loses more of her patience with every breath. Ten rings for the thread. We'll give you two now or hours now and I'll put some of it here. She points vaguely at bits of the gambeson to make it stronger and easier to wear. I think I'd rather have better armor. And then I'll have... It'll be the end of the day anyway and I can sleep. Strengthen my armor. 
Whoa! It suits you well and doesn't encumber you in combat. You spend the time brushing and watering Peabody, practicing combat moves and stances with your axe, and washing your hands, face, and neck. Near the end of the hour, you return to the tailor and sit down on a stump, relaxing to the sounds of Howler's Creek. She asks you to come closer and points at the spots where the seams were ripped and replaced with spider silk, which is much lighter than the old thread. It will make it stronger than this, unless you cover it with troll hide or something. Could I ask you a couple of questions? The boredom in her voice is palpable. I'm not barred. Dance repairs, outfit repairs. Pay one to tidy myself. Sure. So I don't look quite as awful. Maybe that's not worth it. I don't know. Go to the local priest. It's like dusk. So I might not be able to do certain things depending on if it's going to take time. Head south of the dead tree in the main square. Before you get up to the second thatched building, a large man stands up from a bench and gets in your way. He's close to 50, taller than most people you've seen in your life, broad-shouldered. His hair and short beard are brown, matching his elegant woolen robe. A thick club is attached to his right wrist with a leather strap. He left his sandals by a sitting spot. Many want to speak with our guides and teachers, he speaks with a solemn, strong voice. But you're not welcome here. Turn back, stranger. And I know why? You can. He swings his polished heavy weapon. You're from the outside. He cannot be trusted. The boars and slaves of the United Church would crush us if they had the chance before he will allow you to spy on us. We need to be sure it is worth it. I'm your new road warden. Are you sure that no soul here needs my assistance? His harsh look softens. We can handle ourselves. If that changes, Elpis will summon you. Elpis, you say. Oh yeah, th this is where they were saying that they don't like talking to strangers. I assume he's the priest. The priest. Uh, I'll just leave before they get pissed off at me. Uh, go to the square. Oh. Things are happening still. It's getting dark and the inn is loud and crowded. The innkeeper lights up the rush lights and the workers drink. And the guards are preparing for the night's watch. If it wasn't for the presence of the creek and the uncanny lack of beggars, this place would feel like... Pavlovan's marketplace. One of the tables is occupied by a dozen or so kids. None of them look older than twelve. And the youngest one, too dirty to resemble either a boy or a girl, is about six. They are surrounded by their playthings, a mufflon on wheels, an elegant wooden sword, and a painted board covered with rocks. But they are bored and tired. Even though you only get a glimpse of them, the oldest girl notices your attention. She springs up from her feet and approaches you with a few skips. She's already pretty tall, dressed in a worn, subdued tunic. So long that it looks like a sack. Be rude to ignore her, smile, and ask what she needs. 
She puts her hands together and puts a grimace of playful misery. Master Road Warden, hearing such anti antiquated salutation makes it difficult for you to hide your smirk. We are... we here. She points to her group bored. Oh, so bored. She puts the back of her hand on her forehead, letting out a deep sigh. Please, Master, tell us a story or two for each traveler sees with different eyes. The last few words sound like an echo from an old tale. Fine, make room for me at the table. Oh gosh. Uh, the children gather around and ask you for a minute for them to gather their friends and siblings. After a bit of chaos, there are 20 young souls sitting closely to one another on benches, stools, and on the ground. The red-haired twins brought a blanket to lay down on. You have a shorter side of the table all to yourself. The older kids understand your lost look in an instant. They start to hush each other, which causes an even greater amount of noise. But in the end, there are dozens of eyes staring at you with a mixture of boredom and anticipation. I get the impression they don't like my religion. So I probably should not tell them a church story. Tell them one of my adventures. Where I could spice up a story. I would think I'd want to do... Huh. Hmm. Hmm. Tell them about one of my adventures exactly as it helped and tell, tell them about one of my adventures though I spice it up with a couple of small lies. Tell them about Havelvan, which is this home city. It's splendor and mysteries. If anyone has questions, I tell them what I know. I think I should just tell them an honest story of what I did. They'd probably be more excited about this, but then I'm I don't know. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll spice it up a little bit. The story takes quite a bit of time and at one point gets a bit cruel. The youngest kid covers th their eyes, which doesn't block their hearing in any way. As you get to the end, the tension disappears. The older kids clap for a bit, keeping their dignity intact, while the younger ones start to laugh and argue loudly about the best part of your tale. For some reason, two of the girls start to wrestle, pretending to be two of the characters that you just portrayed. Seeing this, the adults decide to intervene. You stand up and the children do the same to show their respect. The girl that had previously talked to you thanks you for your time. It was my pleasure. I returned to my tasks. Go to the innkeeper. Get a room. Sure thing. You know, it's my kids keep it cleaner than you find in the city. Just tell me when you're ready. Thanks. Sleep. Costs two. Sleeping on a muffin pelt. There's a lot of noise outside and you can sense a heavy, unpleasant smell coming from the cauldron. At least the fur is fluffy. You can cover yourself with a blanket. So if I do this, I would get some magic back, but everything else would get worse. If I do this, I get clean. I get, I wouldn't go hungry. I'd get even more magic back. If I did this, what does this do? I'd heal a little bit less, but I would have more magic returned. So I'd have, that's fine. I think I want to heal as much as possible while I have an opportunity to do so. Yes. I am full, or I eventually will be. The sounds of rain wake you up briefly. Before you turn to sleep, you think about your plans. Riding in the mud, mud is difficult. Peabody will have a rough time, especially on the unpaved grounds. Maybe a good day to take a break at the inn. Your first sleep ends, but your usual one hour break is instantly disrupted by noise. 
You stand up, walk to the window, and see the reason for the commotion. A group of workers is just outside the inn, drinking and laughing. Eric, the innkeeper, is among them. You could join them, but if you do so, you won't get a good sleep tonight. And after such a long day, you may end up exhausted. I don't think I can afford to do that. Just rest. Near your time in Havavan, you learned how to ignore drunken crowds. You can relax and return to your routine. Sharpen my blade and go back to sleep. Look at that. Spend the night in peace at a clean bed with a tightly shut window and a warm blanket. In the morning, you find a stool placed by your bed covered with two boiled eggs, a cup of buttermilk, and some mufflin offals. You, once you get dressed and go downstairs, a young boy who's covered in mud and speaks unusually loud and enthusiastically mentions that Peabody has already been brushed and watered. You nod, but he runs outside without noticing it. The innkeeper is sitting near the door, from time to time carrying out another bowl of either stew or gruel. Thias is nowhere to, mm, to be seen. Roach Eric's. Did someone contact you about work for me? Very much so. Ask for Timo. She's usually at the creek just outside the southern wall doing laundry. She wants to find herself a husband. <laughs> There's not much in it for you unless you'll be here for marriage rights. But it'll make her happier. Thanks? Leave the square. Go for Timo the washwoman. Offer my services to the guards. Let's talk to Timo first, I guess. Matchmaking. Before you reach the gate, you find three washwomen who are walking down the path, chatting loudly. The wet hair on their arms and legs shines, contrasting the mud on their feet. Some of them wear soaked shirts, all have heads wrapped in kerchiefs. You know from the city how hard and sometimes dangerous their job can get. You glance over their laundry bats, baskets filled with clothes, and buckets of urine. Once they notice you, one of them puts her things next to a fence and tells the others to go ahead without her. Her companions giggle, but loyally leave the two of you alone. I was so hoping to speak with a vague a traveler. She starts and looks away. Whenever she speaks, she's both very direct and distracted, struggling to explain her plans. After a brief, co brief conversation, you try to sum it all up. So you seek a man who would agree to take part in the marriage rites of your druids. She nods energetically, but then freezes. She's tanned from work, but her face is young and smooth, and since her hair is hidden, her bright hazel eyes keep drawing your attention. Not just any man, she interrupts you angrily, someone who stays in the sun and works hard, for us and our kids. You ask if she has any children already, and after another minute of awkward explanations, you take a guess that she doesn't. You ask if it would make a difference for her to move to a different village. We live good lives here, safe and plentiful. I'd rather stay, but I could leave with a safe convoy. So she's looking for a husband. Interesting. But he has to be a druid or pagan husband. Right. See you soon. And is this the day... Like he was saying, I'd almost be better off not traveling today because of the rain. A, yaman, a woman and a yaman, a woman and a young boy are sitting on a bench. She shows him how to weave a basket. A group of laughing villagers are chasing after a runaway hog. Offer my services to the guards. You'll join a group of guards and druids in their search for useful herbs, ready to carry the elders on your palfrey to safety if needed. This task will take you about a half a day and may get dangerous. Is that worth doing? They might like me more, I guess, but I have no money left? Hey, Zach. Thank you for resubscribing. 21 months. Dang. Welcome back. 
I've got no money. But I just got healthy and clean relatively. And this might go poorly. I'll quick save again. And we'll see what happens. Work for one. Nothing bad happened. Turns out you don't have much to do. You get your job done quickly and with little difficulty. Although it did take some time of the day. Uh... I'm gonna I'm gonna save again and just if I do travel, is it gonna be like a problem? Oh, well, there's all sorts of stuff here. Fishing spa. The muddy roads slow you down. I guess it'll just take longer to go places, but will it also be a detriment to my uh, well-being? I guess we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I've got food. I've got a bunch of food, kind of, but I don't have any money. Or I have one coin now, I guess, that I helped him out. Slow down. Among the shrubs, a small pack of dragonlings is feasting on the carcass of a great auroch. One of them, with red feathers on its arms, strains up and gives you a curious glance. Its head tilts left and right, forward and back. It screeches at you, but doesn't move forward, and returns to its meal. You wonder what would happen if you were on foot. Would they let you be satisfied with their prey or run after you? But if so, for what reason? For now you have enough space to move forward, yet stay safe. Powerful jaws break the monster's bones loudly, then bite off and swallow chunks of meat. Keep my distance and look over my shoulder. This plant shouldn't be alive. Not without leaves. It doesn't resemble the other trees of the wetlands. It's something else. You think about the tree you saw in the square of Howler's Dell, but that was much smaller. You get off your horse and prepare your axe. The water is filled with dirt and dead plants, and it smells like an old corpse. The roots are spreading far, breaking through the water's surface. You don't see any saurians in the grasses or on the shore. You approach the table-like altar made of three limestone slabs. Were these rocks originally as formless as they are now? Or was there a point centuries ago when they were precisely shaped and decorated by masters of artistry? There's no way to tell. Peabody is peacefully observing the dark grass and slapping flies with its tail. Whatever it is that you feel in the air, it's clear that your companion's eyes see this place through very different eyes. So he doesn't seem too concerned. I ask the right for a vigilant eye and a bright soul. You bow your head, trying to imagine an appropriate ritual. Whenever you start a thought, it runs away to the sounds of insects, visions of predators, smells of the muddy water. You rub your hands, focusing on what's in your grasp, collecting your wits slowly. It takes a few moments, but you start breathing without sensing the stench. You arrange all the chaotic images into a cohesive utterance. Your prayer is brief, but once it's done, you feel prepared. Uh, I would need to look my inventory. I'm using... I assume I'll use my better axe automatically. I don't have to, like, equip it or something. Approach the altar. Swamp altar. 
There's clumped dirt in the uneven nicks fused by years of winds and rain. The bottom surface of the table is dusty, but you don't find any spiderwebs or mold, even though it's the perfect spot for them. The tree roots cling to the altar in many spots. They're firmly attached. You struggle to move them even by an inch. The cream-colored limestone is cold and smooth. I do a spell. Use an amulet to detect if there's any magic hidden in the altar. You unpack the wooden spheres, pleasantly smooth and light. The entire set fits in the palm of your hand. You place them in various spots on the altar, next to the roots, beneath it, and a few steps away on the boulder. You begin the ritual, after which all you can do is wait. You go for a walk with Peabody, making sure there are no monsters in your vicinity. When you return to collect your amulets, only the one placed on the rock hasn't changed its temperature. The others are cold. The closer they are to the tree roots, the cold, cooler they are, almost painfully so. This is not what was supposed to happen. If the objects are filled with magic, the spheres get warmer. If not, they stay in their original state. But this? You've never seen such a reaction. Huh. I try something else. I make an offering. What is your sacrifice? Oh. Uh. Golly. Maybe the wild plants. Or do I just say food? None of them seem to make any difference. Axe. Your weapon on the altar, but nothing happens. Can I put the hourglass? Hourglass. Place your winged hourglass on the altar, but nothing happens. Bron what about a bronze rod? Put one of the bronze rods on the altar, and it suddenly starts to corrode. Even though bronze hardly ever does so, not only does it become green, it turns to dust. The tree greets your offering with the sound of moving, stretching branches. So it's like absorbing... Is it absorbing magic? Is that why it's cold? The swamp altar. The tree can drain magical power from various items, which results in their destruction. Offer a magical item. I don't have any other things other than the rods. Well, I'm not going to be able to do that quest anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure. I guess maybe I could just keep giving him more rods, but then I don't even know what this is. Or what it'll do if I do it. It could be like a very bad thing. <laughs> For all I know. Huh. She wants at least four of them though, so I don't I don't even have that many, so Hmm. Guess I'll walk away for now. Look into the water. You step cautiously without knowing how deep it gets. You have to consider that a Saurian could be camouflaged in the mud, waiting for a victim to get near. Since you don't plan to kneel down and drink, you're hoping to dodge the potential strike. Once you get closer, you start breathing again. While well, the water is dirty, it's also shallow. You see the vegetation, swimming insects, and even a small fish. All of them stay away from the tree roots, which will look like a spider web covering the bottom of the pond. Aside from that, you don't see anything that would catch your attention. Take a closer look at the roots. 
You kneel in front of one that's lying on the shore. It's brown, covered with hair that resembles the fur on your arm. When you touch it, it's moist, soft, and warmer than you'd expect. Do something with it. Hmm. I mean, I could axe it. Do we axe the tree? You pull your axe and stop in place. You can't tell what results of wounding the tree would be. I don't know. Don't know what this is. This seems like something that I would possibly ask Foggy about. Either way, I don't think antagonizing Some kind of like pagan altar potentially or whatever the heck this is is a great idea uh do i want to go south or east do you think towards this we'll go east we're somewhere ruined a village Stepped away a second. Standing in front of the gate, you hear no voices, no tools at work, no steps. Dozens of birds live among the collapsed roofs. Their fluttering, singing, and squawking is free of worries. If you want to travel any further, you need to ride around the palisade. Searching the ruins may take a lot of time. You hear a river in the east, separated by the lush meadow, filled with crickets and rodents. There are many tree stumps around you, especially in the west, covered with moss and fungi. Look at the gate. Pushed or pulled, it doesn't move an inch. Someone has spread dirt and rocks both underneath it and around it, seemingly to keep the planks stuck in the ground. I want to open it. You should take a look from the other side to see if it's even possible. Especially since it may take a couple of hours without proper tools. Fine. Go to the clearing. The meadow is lush and colorful, and so dense it's unsafe for a rider. For a couple of minutes, you leave Peabody with a rope, avoiding the potential disaster in case his a hoof falls into an animal den. Being forced to travel around the palisade every time you get here is going to be a pain. Most of the tree trunks look familiar, or similar, and have a comparable size. They were most likely planted with the sole purpose of being cut down and used by the locals, though cutting so many trees at once. That alone could provoke the wrath of the herds. Such a process should be spread across a couple of seasons, and you can't be sure that was the case. In the west and north, the clearing turns into a wild forest. In the south, you see a path leading around the palisade. Leave the clearing. Inspect the palisade in the west. Tracks of human footwear and many, many more ape footprints cover the path formed around the palisade's breach. As far as you could tell, the freshest footprints lead to the village. 
The wooden stakes spread on the ground are rotten, covered in mushrooms, small flowers, insects, and worms. A good source of animal goblin food, though you'd expect them to also hunt for the birds and eggs. The meadow in the west turns into a forest quickly. You shouldn't enter the forest, especially not in this area. It's unpredictable. Where do you want to go? Uh, go to the main square. In every village, the main square is the fanciest area, meant to charm the travelers. Yet this is way more than you expected. The houses are as big as in Havavan. The paved ground took a lot of work and materials. The walls, now charred and riddled with holes, are made of an expensive coated wattle. The tiles, or the roofs, also had to be brought here from a different settlement. You peek inside the three smaller buildings, the rotting remains of their former splendor. The birds living in dozens of nests respond to your arrival with quite a commotion. You don't even find a single dragon bone nor a tool or piece of furniture left unbroken or unrotten. You're surrounded by bad smells, dirt, animal droppings, and garbage. The well also stinks. It has no bucket, but you'd be afraid to use it anyway. Who knows how many birds have relieved themselves inside, or how many old rats have found their death while climbing up the walls. Suddenly you hear some sounds coming from the largest building. You feel a slight aching in your stomach. You should check it out. I prepare my axe. You step cautiously toward the scent of urine and sweat. The flickering candlelight shows you broken furniture, yet no signs of burnt wood. You consider pulling the other door when a masculine voice proves that your presence is not unnoticed. I didn't want it to come to this, but stay where you are. Whatever you put inside, be it a shoe, a hand, or your damn thinker, it'll get a bolt. Relax, stranger. I'm a road warden. I'm a road warden, so I kind of need my thinker. Will the boots be enough? I'm the new road warden. Let's talk. You really got to bet everything on a single shot. Don't miss or I'll get angry. Angry enough to swing my axe. I'll say this, maybe. Relax, stranger. I'm a road warden. You chose this place to visit from all that there are. Even outlaws don't come here. He pauses, then goes on before you respond. It may be you're telling the truth, so let's say this. My little ballista here is all pulled and ready. But you don't want to do... But you won't do anything stupid, right? No running, no jumping around. Show your hands. Someone said that there was a guy with a ballista, didn't they? Who was that? Yeah, I don't, I didn't write it down. I don't remember who they said it was, but there was some guy that was mentioned that had a ballista. The man's voice lacks confidence and his accent is tricky for you. He could be from the distant south, but as long as you don't speak too quickly, you understand one another. You don't hear any other movements, breathing voices. You lean your ax against the doorframe and make sure your knife is well hidden. I walk inside. The dense smell of urine hits you with full force. While well, the tools and utensils are hard to distinguish from rubbish, the route to the upper floor is blocked by the collapsed roof and loose wooden beams. There are scraps of rustling iron and steel on the ground, detached from the now destroyed barrels. The scavenger is sitting on a blanket in front of the tent, pointing at the floor with his loaded crossbow. Not a short man, though a bit skinny. He's tanned, dark hair, and has seen his share of st struggles. There are long claw scars on his left cheek and another one that would divide his eyebrow in half if it hasn't been consumed by fire, just like the rest of his forehead. Yeah, this is the guy. But I didn't write down his name. His clothes are untainted by vanity. He's barefoot in a dirty linen shirt with rolled up sleeves and simple pants that use a cord for a belt. His long beard and hair are untrimmed and tangled. Stand near the door watching his weapon, I'm prepared. He follows your gaze. Uh, 
Not a good way to make the air warmer, I... I try to be safe, that's all. And I can't let you stay in my shelter. You better ride ahead. I already piled up whatever hasn't rotten. The candle lights are dancing on his burnt face and arms. I saw your horse. Maybe you could help me, him. Huh? What are you looking for in this place? You don't sound like you're from the north. It wasn't Asterion, was it? He was different. I mean, I want to... Uh, I need to get to know the peninsula if I'm going to patrol it. You better stay away from the eastern path. No shell rides there anyway. Even the west and the coast have roads like moose crap. I've traveled and pedaled for years now, you know? I wait for some group to join, and here people don't travel. Or know a damn thing about any place. Just waste of time, I tell you. A long pause. Listen. He scratches his thighs nervously. I'm hungry. So damn hungry. I can't hunt or fish with all the ape men around. Can you share anything, Roadster? I may be a drifter, but I won't beg if I had not lost my bags on the road. Good. Got food to spare, I think. Two food rations. Well, okay. Ah, uh, you say so, Bia. Don't know my dearth. He bites into the sausage <clears throat> right away, but after a couple of solid bites, he puts your gifts on an unfolded tunic that's lying on the floor. Without you, I would have had to run after birds with my ballista, but I'll need to save the bolts for the ape men. And because of these stinkers, I can't roast here, and raw meat makes me want to puke. Thank you. After a moment of hesitation, he grabs one of the plums. Now, Roadster, he says with a full mouth, if you have questions, ask. I'll say a lot to make you get out of here. Ask him what he wants. Where do you want to travel now? And what will you give me for my help? Hmm. Yeah, he was in Howard's Dell. Before I think about it, I think I might have gotten to talk to this guy when I played the demo. Because I vaguely remember coming to this place. Talking to this guy who had this wacky accent. Uh, let me explain first. I, I was in Howard's Dell, the closest village to the east and north. People there are nice, you know, not like old Pagos. Those are all boring and grimmer than a crow. But they cry coin for everything and damn good coin. I left, wanted to look around the ruins, see if there's anything left. Then move to Pelt and hire the hunters to help me here. No luck, a bunch of griffs jumped my pack bird. I just bought it, he spits on the floor, fast and nimble, but not brave enough to listen to me when all that screeching and scratching started. So it ran away with my bags. A few fell on the ground and I pulled them here, but you see how it is. I won't travel around with a tent on my back. He taps the crossbow with his fingers. I need maybe a day more, aye, just a day, and I'll have all the iron scrapped from the barrel so I can move forward. Well, can't take all my stuff alone, and without me around, the ape men are going to break in and steal my shit. I need to stay here, and since you have a horse, come back tomorrow and help me return to Howler's Dell? How about it? I just need to know that the road is safe, safe as it can be, I mean. What exactly do you need me to do? I need you to make sure there's no danger hiding on the road. 
from here to Howlers. Or rather, I know there is some danger, but as long as you can get there and safely return, I'm sure we can handle some roaming monsters. He theoretically rubs his hands together. This ballista has hit, hit more beast skulls than I have fingers, and I've never lost a finger, Roadster. Only the toes. Maybe to prove it, he starts to count on his fingers. So, see if the road there is clear, then come here tomorrow. We'll pack my staff up on your horse and move out. But don't come when it's close to evening. We're going to need three hours on our feet, and I won't push through the night. Even sleeping next to an ape tribe is safer. He chuckles. And don't make me wait for too long. I can wait for a couple of days if I find some food, but if you don't get back, I'll have to risk it no matter what. I don't work for free. I have ways to pay you, don't worry. I could give you dragons, but I'll have to sell the iron first. So I'll need a bit of time, you see. Five for a short escort would be plenty, I'd say. But if you want, I'll give you a secret jar of mine. A very fine mixture that scares ape men away. Works on pebbles too. When you ask if all the stench of urine is somehow related to his potion, he just winks and chuckles. I'd also like to learn more about the villages you visited. He seems surprised. I mean, I, sure. But I don't have connections there, you know, just my eyes. He starts to hum. You know, you know. A longer pause. When you get to Hallor's, you'll meet the mayor there for sure, Thias. Whatever you do, don't ask her where she gets her coins from, I? Well, too late. She's rich, stupid rich, but don't ask her how this happened. Trust me. He scratches his beard with a mournful look. Fine, it's a deal. I'm going to escort you. Thanks, Roadster. Just come tomorrow. I'll make it worth your time. Tell me about yourself. He gives you a sullen glance. What for? I've no legacy to keep alive in tales. I may tell you this and that after you take me out of here. Are you sure there's no undead around? He nods. I've seen none. People say it's been less than ten years since the herds came here. But I don't know... Anyone bothered with passing the pyre, raising the pyres? If not, the dead are all roaming the forests now. He clicks his tongue in frustration. It may be that there's a walker somewhere under the debris, waiting to break through like some like a dragon in an egg. He looks straight at you. Aye, you better don't dig. If you search the entire village, there's no hidden treasures left. You come to the wrong place. Time, moisture, and the damn borers devoured all the loot. I've been here for a couple days now, and all that's left is this iron I carried here. I was planning to get back here with some hired muscle and clear the collapsed buildings, but I doubt it's worth the time and risk. Do you know what happened here? Well, I won't guess, but I saw many ruins. There's no treasure in skeletons here, so this place means as much as dirt. Someone was barking too loud, so the beasts broke through and made them quiet again. He clicks his tongue, and that's that. Talking about nature's fury brings bad luck, don't you know? I'm looking for another road warden, a man known as Asterion. I have never met him, but I've surely heard his name many times. He vanished long before I got to the coast. At first, people were asking about him. Now, I th they think he's dead. So is it not really worth me even looking around? I guess if nothing else, I can make sure the gate gates are open. Look around the northern gate. The paths here are almost reclaimed by the grasses. To your east and west, you see shadowy alleyways behind damaged buildings. I want to open the gate. 
It may take a couple of hours, especially without proper tools to help you remove all the ground and rocks. Huh. Let's look around first. Approach a nearby tree. You don't find anything worth picking. The half-dead quinces have maggots crawling under their skins. You wonder which part of this meal is more tempting for the dark-winged birds, sitting among the branches, the flesh of the fruits, or from the worms. Quinces are rarely eaten without having a chance to blet. You are safe. You can safely guess that they were meant to be dried or to add taste to cookies or hard drinks. After a few moments, you realize that the bottom part of the tree just above the ground is partially charred. Someone had to oppose a torch here. But the wet wood didn't burst into flames, so they tried to burn it down, but it didn't work. Look into the well. It's filled up with soil, and you find nothing interesting about the area around it. I guess we'll look around first. Head to the northwest part. Colorful grass covers the entire fence pasture. The large stone placed in the middle suggests it could be a playground for ibexes, or maybe it's just an old garden. You see a couple of small sheds, a latrine, and a single building in the south completely burnt down. All these places were cleaned up by the scavengers. Peabody doesn't want to approach the large ruins in the north. The terrible stench of feces and rotting food scares you off as well. The paths are covered with goblin footprints. It's daytime, so the pack should be asleep. If the beasts were active, they would try to scare you off or hunt down your mount. This is their territory, and when they wake up, you'll face a furious en enemy. I go somewhere else, quietly. Once you look at the village, and the longer you stay around, the more sick you feel. The taste of the gastric juices hits your mouth. Your forehead hurts. You start to stumble. Peabody, worried by your sight, pokes your head with its nose. Walk far away from the walls. Leaning on your mount, you go outside, keeping your mouth shut. After a few minutes, your eyes get clearer. Weird. Maybe better to leave, or at least stay away from the village for the rest of the day. Look around the southern gate. The only the south is completely... Gate leading to the village is completely destroyed. The building is almost burnt to the ground. The sound of the gentle river reaches you from the east. You see a saggy fence surrounding an overgrown pasture. Behind the burnt building in the east, you see an oddly barren field. Take a closer look at the gate. The palisade's in good shape, and the gate wasn't even touched by the fire. It was worn away, possibly or torn away, possibly thrown. The used force must have been huge, but you, you'd expect that it would push the entrance into the village, not away from it. You don't see the marks of a dragon bite. A troll could toss such planks, but after so many years, you see no paw prints. A mage? You can't really tell. Push the building near the field. The broken logs and planks are charred, while the wooden walls are rotted and covered in moss. You see no ashes or dust, proving that the fire happened long ago. The smell is awful, and there are no reasons to stay for long. You see no furniture. Just some broken shelves. It was just a storage room. The valuable odds and ends were already taken by the scavengers. Stop and touch your aching stomach. Inspect the... Uh, yeah, let's just get the hell out of here. The road downhill meanders, slowing you down and forcing you to pay close attention not only to the shadows of the trees, but also to the tight, rocky passages. You don't help but notice a few caves and find ambush spots. I keep an eye out for sign of life. Aha.
Inns like this one fit the region fit the regions traveled by merchants, but you wouldn't expect a place of this size in a forsaken peninsula. The stone and lumber must have been transported from far away, and the workers, guarded by expensive mercenaries, surely lived for many seasons in a primitive hamlet, subsisting on salted supplies. There are seemingly no cracks in the wall, and the building was whitewashed only a few years back. The road is wide and beaten. Dozens of souls could hide if not for the if not in the buildings, then at least in the yard. The expenses and labor put into this fortress were worth many trading ships. Three armed people are on the ramparts, though you only see what's above their waistline. They're leaning on the parapet right next to the gate. You think you notice the glimpse of a smile. They wear gambesons, each one of them dyed differently. Yellow, green, and linen gray. Approach the gate. A woman in yellow armor leans forward. She has long, curly, disorderly red hair pointing in every possible direction. This combination of colors doesn't work at all. In the, wood, in the woods, one would have sh to shout to draw this much attention. There's still a fair distance between the two of you, but she speaks loudly. I had not seen a horse for years now. I just said that it's weird to see such a large jackass, huh? Her voice is young and strong, with an accent that reminds you of the villages spread around Havelvan. But no jackass would wear a saddle, I'd say. She exchanges a few words with a male guard wearing green, giving you time to move closer. Well, this one here says those... There really are donkey saddles. Say, Traveler, how hard it is, is it to ride a horse? How about you give it a try? easy to learn the basics, but it's tiring. You train different muscles than those for combat. You don't say, she gestures with the other soldier to take care of the gate. What sort of muscles? You climb down, staying concise and to the point. You point at your back, hips, and thighs, and speak about the training routine that a rider follows to stay in the saddle for more than two days. As you enter the yard, the woman also uses a ladder to get off the wall, then leads you under the roof where your palfrey can rest. Tethered with a cord to a wooden post near some old hay. Once you're ready, go inside. Speak with our boss, she says with a shadow of a smile. He has time. There aren't any travelers around. The other guards take care of various chores. They peek at your mount every now and then as they're splitting firewood, cleaning their clothes, weeding the garden patches and moving chairs. Two of them are making a rope. You head toward the end, hearing the piercing scream of a boar from the other side of the yard. I open the door. Aha. The open windows fill the hall with refreshing air and the sounds of conversation. A muscular man is sweeping the floor near the stairs, but after he glances at you, he leans the broom against the wall and heads behind the counter. You're lucky to show up. His voice is deep and soft, with a city-like accent. He observes you with a keen attention, yet avoids your eyes. I have a keg of decent ale. Wormwood, bog myrtle, juniper berries, cat's foot. He fills a mug carefully and puts it on the countertop. It's going to spoil soon, today maybe, and we don't drink here before the even. I hate to see the good stuff go to waste. His skin is dark, almost purple, rare among the southern tribes, and the hair is naturally bluish. His clothes are quite fancy for manual labor. The elegant tunic wouldn't stand out in the city square. Stand at the counter. Planks let out a creak after every step you make, so you slow down a bit. You could swear that the innkeeper made little to no noise. Here you go, he pushes the mug forward. But just so you know, my pelt doesn't belong to Pavlovan. <clears throat> you could sleep on the floor if you wish so, but if you want a bed or a meal, you'll have to pay. We may have some leftovers from dinner, but I need the check. I think this guy is also supposed to be like kind of a no-nonsense guy.
<clears throat> Thanks for the drink. I see you know how to make friends with a road warden. I won't stay here for long. I introduce myself. He nods and fills another mug, this time with water. I guess there's no point in waiting for a Asterion, then. I'm glad to see someone taking his place. Even my crew here hits the road only if they need to see the healers and howers Dell, and they're more than resourceful. A road warden is always going to find work here in the north, though maybe not on the eastern road. He takes a mouthful of water and drinks with a pleased sigh. There are no guests here at the time, or hardly ever. I could take a short break. For a brief moment, he meets your eyes. I drink the ale. The dark room and the wooden walls of the mug make the liquid look as brown as chestnut. The lay in spring hits your nose, and the first sip is even too complex, too flowery. While the brewer has used fancy ingredients, the exotic licorice ruins the aftertaste. After you know why there's so much left, maybe it takes an acquired taste. The innkeeper nods. I was hoping to see someone willing to patrol the roads. Maybe you'll help me with a worrying thought I have. Which is? There are brigands in the woods. Our place is a stronghold. So I'm not afraid of an open strike, but they've gotten more active in the last two years. One day they may steal our furs, and I have no doubt they're the reason why merchants come here only once. Having bandits around gets expensive. He rubs his hands together, camouflaging his paws. I want you to reach Howler's Dell northwest from here. It's the largest settlement around. I'm sure you'll get there sooner or later. Ask Thias, the mayor, about Galausia, that bloodthirsty wolf of a woman. Do I know who that is? I don't think so. I've heard rumors about a raid in the north. If Glaucia is ready to break the truce with the locals, I'm going to join forces with them to get rid of her band. He looks at a nearby dragon bone. Not too difficult, right? Just do it when you have a chance. A couple of days won't make much difference. I'll pay you two coins when you get back with the news. Fine? I nod. Great, what else do you need? What do you have for sale? I can go and pick up a few things for you. Some food for your travels to start with. Apples, nuts, sausage, not too many at once. We need to maintain our supplies. I've got an elk fur I don't need. Its buyer was caught by a pack of red wolves. Nice for a sleeping spot. Just as nice for a wall. An almost untouched soap. Priceless for a traveler. You can't tell if he's sarcastic. Made a fine oak ash. Strong, though you should have some better supplies before you start your own bathhouse. After you mention you'd like something more useful on these roads, he looks down. I don't have any blades or armor to spare, but if you pay well, you can take one of our crossbows and a bunch of corals. A yew bow, wool cores, and the trigger just needs a little bit of oil. It's as good as you can get without soaking it in magic. It takes a bit of muscle to draw, but even a 16-year-old could handle it. I won't sell it cheap. I'm ready to give a discount to a helpful ally. Let's take a look. 30. I got one coin. High class fur. Reading for six plus hours. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a time. I'm not gonna lie, I had to take a couple of breaks. But I am intrigued by the story. Take advantage of this moment to stuff my face with a slice of pizza. It 
it is it is cozy in a way it's kind of um the world it's set in is kind of like dark but it's kind of got like certain areas especially when you're in a safe place like this it's sort of peaceful music and this feels atmospheric sometimes you can hear like the sounds of nature and birds and everything else as you're traveling and stuff it's it does a really great job I'm gonna buy the soap anything that I got I don't want to give you my fancy axe but hypothetically five coins it's pretty axe but we don't really need more of them he gives you back your bronze weapons too bad it's not engraved it's worth more than five coins but I don't know what to do with it other than sell it hold on I don't want to actually sell it that that's all does that mean I'm not giving it to him Okay, good. Uh, I'm looking for Asterion, the previous road warden. Are you now? He goes to the table and invites you to sit down with him. I don't think I'm going to be much help. He rests his elbow on the table top and grunts quietly to, re to clear his throat. But I do want you to find him, so... When asked about his intentions, he measures his words. Asterion and I made a risky deal. Well, a very promising one. Last time he was here, he took 50 coins, my half of the investment. He knocks on the table with a fist anxiously. If you get my coin, or at least find out what happened to the guy, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed after bringing me the news. Could it be that Asterion stole the coins and ran away? He looks at a window and starts to play with a shutter. I just think Asterion ain't the kind of soul that would do such a thing. For him, it wasn't much of a fortune. And I'd risk saying he had earned my trust. Not only mine, you know. It's easy for a road warden to make connections. He always had places to go, things to take care of. He rubs the table with his thumb as if trying to clean an invisible stain. I've asked travelers. I sent a couple of my pals to find him. No real no news. I know he stayed in White Marshes for a day and was meant to do something for the people there. I also know he was supposed to escort somebody to a place, spent most of his time between White Marshes, Gale Rocks, and Creeks. There's a village in the northwest, just stay on the main road until you reach the bogs, then enter them. You may even get there before dusk. So let me know once you find anything. We may yet return this whole investment thing. I'll think about it. What can you tell me about the peninsula? Actually, let me look at my journal real quick. I've got all sorts of quests. Find the road warden. Might have disappeared in the wilderness. Last seen in white marshes. According to Howard's Dell. We had a failed mission. This was the failed mission to go to Gale Rocks. Why it doesn't say that there, I don't know. According to Ikekios, Asterion bought a sickle sword from him. Pathfinders use it to cut through thickets. Which kind of makes me wonder if he didn't go into the forest in the middle or off somewhere else. Because I think... I think the one village is over here, maybe. And one over here. I don't know. Who knows where he is? Uh, what could anyone say? This place doesn't even have a name. Unless there's an old book in an archive that no soul knows about. You know what I'd call everything from here to the coast? The hunting ground. He glances at your eyes. 
But it's not us who hunt. Keep that in heart. But the beasts in all shapes and forms. His words gain confidence slowly, which is strengthened by his deep voice. I've lived in this inn for over ten years now, and I've only seen a couple of roads, a couple of places. It's just, once you get here and see how harsh it is to hit the road, you have only more reasons to stay at the warm stove behind a wall, even if it's suffocating. He looks towards the windows. I'm sure you've heard a lot already, that the people don't build hamlets anymore, that there are no more ibexes from the south, and the traders only stay for a few days. All of our iron is used for cauldrons, not swords or tools. Boy, I find traveling west. Well, there are hills nearby, and then you'll find a village, maybe an hour away from here. It was destroyed by beasts almost a decade ago. Nothing to see there. The goblins live there now, so most just travel around it. And they say it's haunted, but who knows? Who cares? I guess that would make sense if it's haunted. I was, like, getting sick just being there. He crosses his arms and starts to sway back and forth, gathering his thoughts. But that also kind of makes me wonder if there's something magic going crazy in one of the houses or something. Anyway, you get to a large tree on the edge of the swamp. For the locals, it's sacred. You're not used to hearing someone mention pagans as if there's nothing unusual about them. There's a small path south which leads to an old mine in the mountains. Nothing to find there. But keep riding north and you'll find Howler's Dell, set at a clean brook. Farmers live there and Mufflons and Druids. They'll let you stay for a night, but they're not cheap. If anyone thinks, thinks my prices are bad, it means they ain't been to Ape Ale Inn yet. Because I've been there. This is that tree he's talking about. So there's mines that are over here. I wish I could <clears throat> write notes on this map. That would be a cool feature. I smile politely. I only know a bit about the next settlement, Old Pagos. The soil there ain't too fertile, so they work in their quarry to help other settlements build things in exchange for crops. The forests and hills aren't too harsh, but the Seekers have a small monastery nearby in the mountains. I don't care much about them. I should write that down. A mo monastery. <clears throat> I don't care much about them. They keep to themselves and they don't pay well. The third village is unknown to me. White marshes set at the bogs. I heard it smells like a griffin's lair. I've heard a lot of nasty rumors about the place, but I won't share them. I don't want to be a lie spreader. Everything I hear is that they do necromancy up there. So, three villages really. Howlers, the one near the monastery, whatever it's called, and marshes. Don't let their beds and palisades fool you, though. Weird people live there. Don't tell them more than you need to. You wonder if something... <clears throat> something wait what you wonder if it's something he would tell other travelers as well i looked over at my stream session and i just hit eight hours off awful horrible Uh, are the eastern roads as rough, rough as I heard? It's strange that I ask these questions this way, considering I've already been around the loop, you know, but whatever. Pretty much. Don't leave the main road, I'd say. Not so far from here, you'll find an old dolmen. A few of my people had to spend a night there, and monkeys stole food and gods from their bags. It was their fault. One of them had fallen asleep in the middle of his watch, but you know. The eastern forests are wild, the roads are rough. Almost no soul lives there. 
One day, all these roads will be swallowed by the trees again. The furthest my team has ever gotten was the home of the Enchantress. So stay on track until you reach the crossroads right near an abandoned watchtower. From there, turn east. You'll recognize the place. It's a nice home in a lonely meadow, surrounded by a wall. He looks towards the closed window, then you again. Kind of like our walls, but simpler, without coating. He lives as a hermit, Eudocia. I don't even know how she survives there, but if you don't have decent coin, you won't find much there. So back to the crossroads. If you tur turn left instead, you'll see a road. People st stay away from it, but it connects the tower and the monastery, a shortcut between the two sides of the peninsula. I was warned by the locals not to use it. It already belongs to the beasts. Is he talking this way? If you go into the heart of the forest? Huh. Have you ever been to the northern coast? I only know about another inn. It's far from here, maybe a day on foot, a bit less from the eastern side. His eyes once again focus on the floor. I've never been there, but I've heard it's a safe place, close to villages of fishers and hunters. Though I don't know much about them. I think that's... He's probably talking about this and then Creeks. is a village nearby uh, somewhere over there. That's all I need. Uh... Didn't expect to find an inn of this size in a place such as this. Ah, uh, so you know a thing or two after all. His mocking tone is soon replaced by a gentle smile. It was built long before we arrived. It didn't work out well for the uh, previous owners. Once the war ended, they left. Not enough travelers, bad trade. The villages stick to themselves. We, however, came prepared, and now we're prospering. When you ask him how they can afford all the supplies, he runs his fingers through his dark hair. I'm not against running an inn, but we don't rely on guests. We're the ones doing all the trading. My hunters are a clever bunch and stay safe in the forest. In exchange for furs, claws, and bones, we get what we need and more, both from the south and the north. He relaxes in his chair. We have a good life here. We spent a whole lot on armor, crossbows, lumber, spears, but in another 10, maybe 20 years, we'll have enough savings to move to Hovelven and not work another day in our lives. We take risks, but smartly. The team is stronger than ever, and we've got plans for us. Makes me wonder what his 50 coin investment thing was. I feel like this is a very poor thing to ask somebody. Is there a good story behind the inn's name? Probably not. I mean, there's a story, but not a good one. He clears his throat. For years, I wanted to have an inn called Pelt, but in my city, it would be in bad taste. Taverns and inns named with a single word were cheap and a nasty reputation. There was the claw, the mugger, basilisk, <clears throat> and blissful, I think. The good places were at least two words. Empty barrel, rose and helmet, empress's smile, pig head was the exception. That was a real dive. He chuckles. In my soul, it's still just a pelt. Pelts are what we came here for. What will make us reach our goals. Uh, any rumors? I don't like to talk about people who aren't nearby, but... You know what you're doing. Who are you wondering about? I mean, Foggy, the tavern keeper, I assume. You'll find her on the northern road far from here. Truth be told, I don't know much about her. Tavern and inn owners don't have many opportunities to see each other, he chuckles. But she's a fun one. Drinks a lot, makes feasts. 
Ain't as scared of beasts as most people. Looks like there's some good coin to be made in her scrap. The peninsula? He looks away. Who would have guessed? Maybe she just has a nose for coins. Uh... Talia. Ain't seen Talia in quite some time. Since her squad vanished in the fog, she's been careful. Glad to know she's still alive. She's too inexperienced to lead the others to battle, I think. He shrugs. Like most people, she needs to follow others, but she already knows that. There's nothing worse than a fighter too stupid to limit their ambitions. Uh... What's the name of that guy or girl? Egidia. She was a tearful girl, but had a good eye. It was sad news, her death. There aren't many people willing to spend years with a bow. One day she would have made a fine huntress. I think that was that one guy's name. Not sure who to ask him about. Nothing you need to know about me to survive the road. I'm Iesan. I've been in a city. Now I'm here. Ah, uh, our Dalit? Why do you ask? I've known her since she was a girl. You better not bother her. If you're looking for a master of the crossbow, she's an obvious pick. Foragers? They were here a few times from the trading band from Creeks. Simple but honest ones, just like the rest of their village. Too clumsy to hunt, especially Alon. But they know how to handle themselves. Lost in his thoughts, he goes on without looking at you. They drink a fair bit, but you wouldn't believe how much they eat. And not just groats, but meats. They have no druids around, but none would want to live with them. They are like a well without a bottom. And z z zivi. He glances at you and shakes his head slightly. Let's just say a trail of nasty rumors follows him. Uh. Ella. He ain't like his brother, Efren. He doesn't fight and was here only once, simply to introduce himself to me. Ella may only be twenty or something, but he carries a soul twice his age, and that's a good thing. You know, in Creeks, they are either elders or kids. They lack those who would put together plans for the years to come. It's a big burden to carry in a village where every adult has a right to vote, but most of them don't care about anything that won't land in their bowls or beds. Does, does he know about just locations? Like, uh... Fallen tree, or am I asking about people? He's asking about people. Help us. I ain't met her. The priests don't want to speak with strangers. But I've heard this and that. More of a sorceress than a fighter. She's been a leader of the druids for about ten years now, I believe. She's... He looks around and leans closer to, to you. I heard that as the years go by, the druids are turning wilder, less human, you see. I've heard she's already halfway there. He nods and straightens up. There must be a reason why Wright's folks were fighting the druids. Their blood gets bad. What did it add to my journal? Ruined village. The event occur occurred at the same time as a few others. Newcomers arrived at Pelt of the North. Elpis became leader of the Druids. Eudosia left Old Pagos. Huh.
Theus. People say she's a good mare, but she's rich from birth, so also careless. She doesn't know the struggle, the hunger, and dirt, so fancies her clothes more than one should. She thinks she keeps her village safe, even though it's the druids who do all the work. He looks down, but finally speaks again. She may be frivolous, but isn't stupid. If you're smart, better keep your eyes open. Eric's. Let me think, Thais's husband? I barely talk to him ever. He stays inside cooking and spends a lot of time with their children or in the garden. I admire people who take care of orphans, especially if they treat them like their own, not just as a free hand to plow the field. He tilts his head to the right and frowns gently, but I also don't think he's much of an innkeeper. Opus Eric Thais. Big guy, right? We barter and howlers with him. We get coins, food supplies, and linen. Don't expect him to give you any good prices for furs and trophies. Big guy, you say? He actually lost a lot of weight. That's good to hear. Better for the heart, legs, and soul also. Uh, I wanted to ask about Arentius. He avoids your eyes, thinking about the answer for a good few breaths. You shouldn't talk about Orentius, and you won't have a chance to meet with him anyway. Ever since he leads White Marshes, only the trusted allies of the village can hear his teachings. He lets out a quiet grunt, almost a chuckle. I'm not sure how he got so beloved in the first place. He's greater in thought than he is in heart, not a people person, you know. Can you just tell me about that guy? F F F Ren. The people of Creeks are send a trading band to us. It's with Ephrin in the front. He's not so much of a fighter as he is a pathfinder, but he's killed enough beasts that I invited him to be our ranger. Too bad he loves his home too much, he says with the tone of someone who describes a completely alien experience. Unlike his brother Ella, he's a man of action, not of layered schemes. Consulting my notes. Anybody else I could ask about? Thais, Ella. Eudocia's crazy. She lives in a lonely house all by herself, skinny and dirty like a corpse eater, surrounded by golems. She never smiles, never cries. One of those. She never leaves her home, and if you see it from far away, it looks abandoned. A few times a year, people travel to her and trade barrels of food for magical items. Well, not a large man, though broad-shouldered, red hair and beard. I don't know what to say. raises a muscled arm and places a hand on the back of his neck. He was a fine fellow, but I doubt he's alive. He always tried to stay away from things. Let's say, people knew him, but he didn't really have allies. <clears throat> Maybe the locals know what happened to him, yet decided not to help him. Or they wanted to get rid of him. He leans forward, looks at his boots. The Starian was a fine man, quiet one, but not dumb. He aided me many times, not for free, of course. And when he couldn't finish the job, it was for damn good reasons. You know what? He looks at you in the eyes. He was scrupulous, patient. I'd be shocked if he died because of some mistake of his. If he bandits got to him, why not? Hmm. Uh, I feel like there's one more person I want to ask about. Did I ask about 
Velasia. Better more than one. She's older than me, wrinkled, tanned. I don't know how she survived for so long. I've heard she's from the coast. Don't really know her story. She's strong, though, and convincing. She wanted to move her hand to pelt, make huts in the courtyard. When I told her to leave, she didn't make a scene or anything, but her face, it was chilling. He looks at the stove. She may want revenge. Gossia is a cruel soul in a scary shell. Heat mage taught by druids of howlers, he may be a loon, but he knows about herbs to help with some gentler ills. I haven't spoken with him myself. He never leaves the bogs, especially since he moved away from the walls of white marshes. You ask why he lives by himself, but the innkeep scratches his ear. He got some into some argument with the priest, some death in the family, I think, and refused to put the others at risk. I don't know, it sounds personal. I think I've asked about pretty much everyone. Buying the tailor, a quiet one. Everything we wear is from her, this included. He grabs the bottom of his tunic and stretches at it a bit. Stretches it a bit. Looks good, don't you think? Most of the clothes we brought from home got ruined after several years, and our gamisons need a lot of repairs. He suddenly lets go of his outfit. You know what? Bayan has asked us to bring her any spider silk we find. If you ever get some threads, sell them to her. I think I've asked, like, everything I could possibly ask. What time is it? An armorer? A woman in yellow armor is kneeling next to a brown hairy boar, which is resting on its side. Oh, boy! a long one. Beast is not as large as the dark ones from the forest. It responds to the touch of the human's hand and brush with a grateful grunting and rapid twitches of a hind hoof. No matter how friendly it appears, it's still tethered to the well. You have no doubts it ch its charge would leave Peabody dead in a breath. Just pick up the game tomorrow or whenever. Don't force yourself. I know. I'd like to at least finish what is possible for me to do here. And I guess I don't have a reason to go back there, but I would be in a good place then to next time circle back around or head back that way. I, I, I've sort of opened up a lot of opportunities of things to do. Uh, when the woman notices, she steps forward to the boar's disappointment. So the new road warden. She points at a window with her chin, forestalling the question. We don't need anything now, but when we travel with our furs, we can use some assistance. She may be around 30, but her warm voice and bright smile are camouflaging the touch of time on her unpowdered face. Like many red-haired people with freckles, her skin is an unhealthy pale. The boar runs up to her, observing your boots and fruitlessly sniffing for food beneath the beaten ground. 
She pats its back but maintains her focus. How about a game or two? We have a bit of time. We could talk a bit about this and that. Maybe we'll get a couple of coins or lose one. She winks. We could play dice or throw axes at a target. I don't have money. I don't gamble. I want to call it gambling just a couple of games. Her smile disappears. She returns to the other guards. Finding anything to do in this hole isn't easy. Last time I saw a bard from the south, I don't remember what it was. This is kind of what I wanted to ask you. This guy was like... He really likes her, apparently. I met Elan. He says hi. She looks up, twirling her hair as she thinks, I'm sorry, who? Uh-oh. Foggy's son. She gives you a beaming smile. Ah, so that's his name. His accent is so thick I kind of misheard it. Forgive me. How he, How's he doing? You gossip about the man and his companion, and a couple of the hunters join your conversation, asking about the eastern road, the tavern, and traveling in general. A good couple of minutes is spent on discussing fashion in creeks. Some of the hunters regret not being used to wearing leather and furs, while others are convinced that linen is more convenient. And if you're cold, just put on a cloak, says a woman with a bandage on her neck. After some time, the guards walk away, leaving you with Dalit and the napping boar. A job for your crew, there's goblins in the nearby ruins. I don't think I can pay anybody to do anything right now. I think it was worth doing anything with these rods other than selling them or doing other weird stuff with them. Because I only have three left and she... The lady who gave them to me said I couldn't even get paid for them unless I planted at least four of them. So I think it's not worth even trying to do that. Show the arrow I found near the fallen tree. Did any of you drop this? She returns it without hesitation. Now we're taking ours from villages in the south, and they don't use pheasant feathers. The locals ask too much for their arrows, as if they're filled with numa or something. Have you ever been the heart of the woods? We sometimes hunt south from there. They're good hunting grounds in the western half. The second one is too overgrown. Maybe the soil is different. She shrugs, then moves the hair away from her forehead. But it's a risky spot. There are treants there and wolves, even the furless ones. Someone else was talking about a furless wolf as well. That was that guy, actually, that crazy guy. Up in uh, Foggy Lake. Uh, and if you have to go through the tall grasses, watch out for what's on the ground. There ain't many archers in the trees. She smiles as if it's a joke. But there are all too many worms, even larger than a water leech. Dalit, right? Oh? She giggles to cover her confusion. Are you asking me out? I ain't interested in any silliness. I'm not. She brushes away the hair from her forehead, the tangled chaos... All over her scalp, cares not for her efforts. Well, yeah, half my life ago I was living on crops, but I bet I've shot down more monsters than you've broken eggs. Are you much of a fighter? Many more eyes turn towards you. Something pleasing and triumph. I fight to protect others. That's my job. 
you live as a traveler, you face enemies, not really an option. Hard to say. I mean, I'd say this, I guess. Not really an option. I have to fight. The doubt pets, pats the boar. The guards get back to their own affairs. I guess, but there's always an option. To stop the journey, one should always look for a new home. Questions about this place. Not much to tell, honestly. There's many beasts around, both wild game and dangerous monsters. We spend our time surrounded by these walls, leaving only to hunt, forage, or trade. I assume we're talking about this tower. That's an unusual tower. I'd expect it to be closer to the gate and shorter. Like in Havlovan? Fair, but it ain't here to protect the gate. This stronghold was built long before we moved in, and not to fight off humans. The tower was meant to be used by those who observe the deep forest. We look out for fires, dragons, and any winged creatures that are trying to roost on the roof. Baldy. She nods towards a man who indeed is completely bald, has a great eye, and sees well even in darkness. You don't say. Uh, any interesting creatures live nearby? Ah, here? Everything lives here. She flips her hair. I swear we saw a few dragons, a unicorn family, a battle between trolls and goblins, faced two beastmen, oh, and a gargoyle, and a hunting queen. Shouts all the time. What is a hunting queen? Is that a beast? Hunt lords? and hunt queens. Spend their ta lives trying to take over the land of their opponents or looking for a promising mate, but only for the time it takes to copulate. They can quickly run, climb, and jump on four paws, but are also more confident fighting on their hind limbs. Larger and stronger than a bear, they are known to be perfect killers. Their deafening roar, which cuts through the air whenever they finish their hunt, can be heard every night. Whoa. So they're like big bear things. I could tell you all about him, but I won't. She winks and pats the boar on his head. You know, hunters have their secrets. You seem quite attached to this boar. How could you not? She crouches and raises the boar's head, but it steps away and squeals as if someone's murdering it. He came with us from the city just in case. We had no clue how our first winter would go, so we needed some backup meat. And it works, too. Cleans the dirt. She reaches out to the beast again, but it trots away. The woman straightens up with a pleased sigh. We haven't needed to eat it so far, but it's also funny. I learned in the home village that the farm boars are getting a bit smaller and more cuddly. Kind of like ibexes. So it's not such a wild, dangerous beast. But we won't let it get close to other animals or children. What do you usually hunt for? Anything we can eat or sell. If there's a partridge, a squirrel, or a rat, we don't complain. But when we move as a group, we look for something larger. Deers and aurochs are delicious, but we don't always look for taste alone. There's value in bones, antlers, claws, tusks. Things people use to make tools or sculptures. We use some of them to make tools and spears. You can never have enough spears. She pauses and looks at a strand of her hair, then suddenly speaks up again. And we look for furs, of course. What can I find north from here? Sorry, I don't really go to those regions. We stay close to home, but only sometimes move south or west to Howler's Dell. But only to trade. They're fine with buying more than they need, since they then take wares to the coast. She takes a long breath, twirling her hair and gathering her thoughts. You know what? I've never seen a beach, and I've been living here for how many? More than ten years now. She giggles. The only part of the sea I've seen is from old Pagos, which is placed on a hill. I've never put a toe in salt water. She looks towards another huntress who confirms that her experience is the same. 
but old Pagos is a good place, as long as you don't mock their order and act nice. They'll also be kind. Boss says they're too serious for him to stand them. At the least they don't bite without reason. Old Pagos. Someone else told me it was a grim and boring place. Have you heard anything about necromancers? It's something new. Her voice lowers to a whisper. I've never been to White Marshes, but over the years we saw people moving away from their south. They told us that the place has changed too much. A priest died, I think, and a new one awakens the dead. Sorry, Road Warden, that's all I know. She's hiding something. She sounds convincing. I'm going to ask you this, but I don't think I'll be able to actually hire him. As long as it involves someone paying for it, I'm ready to listen. What do you know about the pack? Without interruptions, you tell them as much as you can. Getting rid of them will do the trick, sure. But as long as those buildings ain't raised to the ground, new beasts will move in. Sooner or later, though, I ain't one to stop you from reaching into your pouch. Though I ain't one to stop you from reaching into your pouch. A brief smile quirks her lips. I'm confused by what she's saying there. Now you need to take care of some things first. Hunters or not, we won't raid a lair blindly. This is one of those games so intriguing I'm ruining it by starting over and over. <clears throat> I definitely feel like if I enjoy it, I'd like to replay it and make some different decisions. It's definitely a game that allows you to do that. And I've been focusing on like, I've only got the one save, but you could pretty easily make a bunch of slaves, a bunch of slaves, a bunch of saves. Eight, eight whole pages worth, plus some quick saves. And there's an A. I misspoke. A bunch of saves. Does it not? I'm just confused because there's a... There's an A, which you'd think would be auto saves, but it doesn't seem like it actually auto saves. How did the tree go? I decided not to do anything to the tree. After I, I put a magical rod next to it and it disintegrated, I decided to not do anything else because I didn't know enough about it. layer blindly. What do you want me to do? She lists your task one by one. Tree with hairy roots was left alone after ruining a quest for you. Hmm, spoopy tree. <laughs> you could say that. She lists your task one by one, in the meantime, bending forward to brush the boar. Make sure you've looked around the entire village. My crew will get mad if it turns out that yet another lair is just behind the corner. Then be sure that there's no soul around. When we fight, we don't do rescue jobs, and if we do, they cost a lot. The boar grunts and turns around, leading her to its other side. Speaking of which, for you it's going to be... She squints her eyes a bit. Fourteen coins. But we'll take some of the loot we find. We won't let go of magic swords and rings just because. Not that I expect any. She straightens up. But who knows? Just so you know, I'll bring an axe with me. She looks at you as if you're a lunatic. We won't take you with us, Biddle. If you can kill a goblin, good, but we have a team. Our own words, knowledge of our strong and weak sides. We don't need you around. Just give us two or three days after you pay us and we'll take care of it. We'll return to it later. Uh, any useful knowledge? 
I told you about. I told you knowledge is valuable. I don't know. He looks at the boar, which seems to be obsessed with a clump of grass growing next to the wall. Fifteen dragons, no less. N uh, discount for friends? Well, it depends on the friend. She gives you a radiant smile. Let's say 15. If it's too much for you, maybe ask me after you spend some time around. Show us what you're capable of. Or play dice with us, if you have an hour to spare. These folks here, she starts to whisper and points with her thumb at the guards behind. They crave gossip. I don't have any money. I can't gamble. I feel like this is a lie. I don't remember him telling me that. Elan said you like talking about beasts. She giggles. Don't you say such a thing. You make me sound like an old lady. I'm still a hunter, not a talker. She winks at you. Fine. 13. Still don't have money. You walk past the well and find a small open shed, not unlike the stable with a humble set of tables, carving tools, hammers, sharpening stones, pincers, knives, and other tools. As long as something can be solved by brute force, this place will find a way to do so. There are two people sitting on a lawn bench. The first one is a male with maybe inch-long hair, a cleanly shaven face, a thin, long yellow tunic, bare legs, and sandals. He ignores your presence, sewing a gambeson with great concentration. Second person is a boy, maybe 15. He's wearing the crude outfit of a farmer. He glances at you, but soon returns to sharpening a long dagger. Greetings. The man raises his head, but it's the boy who speaks focused on his task. He ain't talking. Tell him what it is you need. The man smiles in confirmation, looks at the piece of garment in his hands, then looks around, shrugs and returns to you with a raised eyebrow. I mean, not right now, but I may be in need of your services. He nods, points at the laces in front of your jacket, raises his clenched fingers to his shoulders, then gently spreads and lowers them as if he's taking off a robe. He follows commands and allow him to properly inspect your gambeson. After a few minutes, he gives it back, then reaches for his pouch. He pulls out one dragon bone, shrugs, then another one and waves both of them in the air, pursing his lips. He makes a few speech-like noises with his empty mouth, groaning what sounds like, I don't know. I consider his offer. So he could repair it if he needed to. Could you patch my clothes if they were torn? He shakes his head and points at the uneven seams on his own tunic, then grabs a crude bone needle and shows you its broken head. He wouldn't even... He wouldn't even if he had the tools, says the boy, but you can try and howl as Dell or Gale Rocks. Look at the youngster learning the trade, I see. Kind of. He answers reluctantly, but his teacher pats his knee, giving him a harsh look. The kid clears his throat. Yes, but we both ain't masters, you see. There's not a soul to teach us, so once I'm ready, I'll try hunting instead. Fixing things for others is boring. The man grunts at sound, but you don't understand it. Seeing your face, the boy chuckles. He said, safe. Let's meet in the middle. Boring, but safe. Go to the well. Washing clothes. Recently renovated wooden roof covers the well from rain and birds. One of the guards is enjoying the cold drink he drew with a bucket. It tells you to use only as much water as necessary. Oak ash soap and teeth set you own can help you get cleaner. Step away. Huh, I think I did everything here that I can do for now. I wanted to write down though. Pelts. Yason is the Innkeeper guy. Dalit was saying. Of 
clear the goblins from the ruined village for rice. And that guy in the village needs escorting. But not till tomorrow. But at the same time, I could also deliver a message. What was the lady's name? Bias? Anyway. Uh, let's make sure I am f saved. For sure. And that's saved. And we'll call it quits there. Very fun game, though. looking forward to playing him more.